Hello? Wow. With background music today. Just a little bit, a little low. I'm gonna try it out. I, th I think it's gonna be cool. Just mess, tinkering around with some of the features I have available in OBS. I just want to get as much experience as possible. All right, well, welcome to day, oh, I should change the day. All right, we are on day four where I am just going through and doing the practice exercises in Bayesian cognitive modeling and allowing you guys to follow along if you're interested in you know, just seeing how I think through some of these problems and you know, play around with some of the code and talk my way through understanding some of the intuitions behind each of these particular problem sets. T today. Matcha ginger, it's a new tea, so try it out. I was asking my friend if they think the music is too loud on the stream. All right, well, I'm just gonna clear this out for today. Since last time, let me pull up the book. Last time we did, I think the last exercise for oh we were still in the Gaussians chapter. Oh, this is yesterday, right? We we're still in the Gaussians chapter, and we had finished the last exercise for the seven scientists example, where we were looking at measurement uncertainty surrounding each of the seven scientists. So now we're going to move to looking at capturing multiple measurement occasions on intelligence for a set of individuals. Here we are. This is going to be the graphical model we're going to be working with. Uh, and for this model then, what it just shows here is that each individual person is going to have a average intelligence score while the variance surrounding the intelligence scores are assumed to be the same across each of the people's subjects yeah and we're gonna have both multiple subjects and multiple measurement occasions for the tests So we can just go down and I'll open up the code then for this graphical model and we'll break down exactly what's happening here. 
and we'll go through these. Yeah, there's only three exercises for this one. Yeah, so we'll, we'll just go through each of these. Right. Still have the code open from yesterday, so I'm just gonna open up all the new docs. Thanks, guns. The only thing about it is I'm having trouble making it so I can hear the music too, but the stream can hear the music. <laughs> so that's where I'm at with that. So it's almost like I'm giving music, but I'm not getting music. <laughs> See, I'm looking. Alright, so we're going to open the IQ examples. I wonder if I can get my dock to go over to the other side. I think it's stuck over here. I need to hide. set my our studio so that my environment's clean and then I'm just gonna make sure that I'm in the right working directory spoke about that yesterday it's just easier since we're really deep in the file structure here even though we're in a project, it's still just easier to pick this directory so I don't have any confusions about where JAGS is going to look for this text file. Right. So just reading through then the model code here, we have model, so data is Gaussian, different means common precision. So what that means then is for each individual here, we have a nested for loop. So within each individual then, we have this vector ij or matrix ij, which is going to be a normal distribution with mu. This is distributed as a normal distribution with a average for each subject and then a common precision measurement and then for priors here we use their fairly uninformative priors with sigma being uniform zero to 100 and i think we talk more about that later how that might we might be able to make a more informative prior here because we have some information about well, how do these sorts of intelligence tests tend to vary across the population, as well as what does the average tend to be? So we have, we have some inf expert information we might be able to bring into to bear some more informative priors here. 
So then lastly, then our prior, we have to build a prior for each of the individuals. So we have an individual prior, zero to 300. Once again, this is gonna be a use case where this might be not be the best way to model this sort of data, but it's gonna be the sort of baseline way. So now we'll load a matrix here and we'll take a look at it. So this is the matrix of subjects. Looks like we have three subjects and three measurement occasions. Um, which is which? I can buy now. Right, people, measurement occasions, right. So each of the rows then is an individual and then each of the columns is a measurement occasion. So V1 here is the scores in the intelligence test, first one, intelligence test second, intelligence test third. And we wanna know the average for an individual and then globally how precise the measurements tend to be. So what's the spread on these measurements? Walking our way through the code then, this is interesting we might we haven't seen yet but to initialize mu repeat a hundred n times so we have 300 mu's oh repeat a hundred three times which three so we we're initializing on uh, okay so you have to initialize for each one of the means that's interesting i didn't see that before Now here's the Jags sample code, so we'll run that. And let's just get some, let's also let it give us some diagnostics here. But what might be interesting to do here is using some of the code from yesterday. The seven times this code. So I spent a lot of time yesterday trying to make this on the bus graph. But I think I might be able to make a quicker one and look, take a look at the means now. So here we're just gonna get all the mu's. In this case, we have 99999, right? Distributions for each of these subjects. Subject one, two, three. Bunch of measurements. We're gonna look at new and we're look at subjects, subjects, function of subjects.
Oh, look at that. Nice. We get the three distributions for each of the subjects here. That's good. That worked. So these are each of the average intelligence scores for each of our subjects. Cool. You know, in this particular example, it might just be nice to do something like this. Yeah, each on the same one. And we could even do a fill instead. is ready yeah all right all right let's talk about it I think we're ready to move to the, the questions now so here we model each of the distributions for the intelligence scores for each of the three individuals and we modeled Sigma so they have the same the reason why they look the same I guess well, not I guess, but the reason why they are similar is that they are all operating under the same sigma. So that's why you see that the three distributions or posteriors here are about the same spread, but just in different locations across possible values for the average. Yeah, I don't know how I did that, but... Now I have space. Weird. So let's read the question. So what do you want to know? Use the posterior distribution for each person's average to estimate their IQ. What can we say about the precision of IQ tests? We can say that it's quite precise overall. Average sigma and sigma ranges from three to 12. Median, 5.7. And we can see that here, we're, we're not seeing that much range. So people can be uh, upwards of here and here. So these sort of priors that we specified for mu might be a little meh because we're not seeing a lot of variance here in our measurement occasions. I see now. Now use a more realistic prior assumption for M. Theoretically, IQ distributions have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. This corresponds to having a prior mu of D norm 100 and then precision this. And the reason why this value is because 1 over 15 squared, which is 1 over sigma squared, is equal to lambda, which is what we used to distribute a model in JAGS. So lambda. So now it just wants me to change my priors. So I'm going to use an average of 100 and then 0 0.044, right? Zero, zero, 
All right, so now what we're gonna see is a change in potentially the distributions in the mu's. We got some issues. Error in mu one invalid parent value. to be something with this. Uh, it's because I still have a uniform distribution. Yeah. So I just needed to change this to be a normal distribution. All right, we can look at the differences here. So let's just take a look. We changed the prior here, so um, we didn't change any information or evidence about the likelihood. Evidence given to us by the likelihood, we only changed information about the prior. And in doing so, here's what we get. So we have initially this, this. So it doesn't look like subject three moves. However, let's see, 95, so our third distribution, our second distribution moves. Oh, our third distribution moves. Doesn't look like that much change actually happens at all. We do see a change in sigma, the larger variance, larger variability. So here's the average.
Looks like the variance decreased around the averages. So tighter estimates. Except for the third one. But the third one is farther out than what we've specified. Right? So before we had this uniform distribution where like values of intelligence of 300 were possible, but now we have a more risk realistic prior here. So it a value of 150 is pretty out there, it seems like. We also have a larger estimation of sigma. But the question asks us about the mean, so. Yeah, it really impacts this third value. Repeat both of the above stages using both priorities on mu with new but closely related data sets. How do the different prior assumptions affect IQ estimation? All right. So we have the new data, and now it wants us to run both models. Whoa, sneak peek. Precise, Excuse me. look at those estimates. Changes in data, boom. I think we have our answer, folks. Because the estimates, I mean, look at them. Just let's visually inspect the data here and show 50, 55, 60, 54, 55, 56. Of course, we're going to have more precise estimates of the mean. That should make sense. But let's take a look at the other distribution. Which I have to go look up. Right. Toy. Toy. 
tight and more longer tails. Looks like. Yeah, look at the. There's no no spread or, or dispersion surrounding these estimates. They're very precise. However, here you can see the standard deviation around the estimates of the mean are a little larger. And part of that has to do for accounting for this larger uniform distribution that we used as our prior. But the estimates don't change. That much. Sweet, chapter five. Oh, something I wanted to do, which I think we can still do, since we just finished this one. I want to pull up some stand code. So I, I found the stand code for this book. The book is commonly written in JAGS. Stand is another probabilistic programming language where we're able to code up these sampling resampling procedures in R, and interface with R. And it also gives you access to a lot more cool graphics and, you know, in some contexts it can be quicker. So it, it's important to have some flexibility across programming languages here. So I just want to get some exposure to some of the syntax for writing stand code while I look at JAGS code. So I'm going to pull up the JAGS code after I sip my tea. Uh, stand code. Go find it. Keep it here. go all right so the, this is Dan code here written in quotes so we'll, you load the stand package and then here we have an integer, which is a discrete variable with a lower bound of one, and we call it n. And this is for our data. Then we have another discrete with a lower bound of one, and we call it m. So this is for subjects and measurement occasions. And then we have a matrix, n, m, and we call it x. Parameters our vector with lower bound zero, upper bound 300. For n, mu. So this is a vectorization, I think. No. Implicit uniform distribution. So mu, distributed, uniform, here, sigma, real value, y, real, and vector here, because we have multiple, we don't. So here's the model, different means, common standard deviations, so for i, i, and j, so similar here. For ij, distributed, normal, mu i, mu i, sigma. We can just use sigma here. We outline our data, specify and initialize. 
specialize the data to a list, initialize some of the starting values for our chains, choose which parameters we're interested in, and then we sample Stan. And here's the Stan model. We could even go ahead and run this. See what happens. Pretty small, just 2,000 iterations, one chain. We're going to use every single observation. No warm up, no burn ins. And then no seed. There we go. One chain. Done. Let me take a look at this. It gives us a similar kind of. Output. Nice. Okay, that takes summary. Summary samples just gives me chain summaries, which is nice. It gives me the summaries for the chains. We look like we could use a little more time. So these are like the uh, theoretical effect size, I think. Or not effect size, but just the number of sample. It's like the equivalent of how many samples this estimate is used. The equivalent of how many samples would, would be used to calculate this estimate. So it gives you a sense of how much confidence you can have in this estimate when this value is high. And this is a convergence statistic. And we want it to be one. This would show that we'd probably want to increase our sample or number of iterations or use another chain. Cool. Yeah, so this did everything that we did before, except now what's cool about this is we get a stand object. And stand objects are nice because we can do a lot of or there are, are a lot of helper functions and packages that have been developed and are continuing ongoing being developed that interface really nicely with stand objects like base stats is a one that is fairly well known we can go pull one up so plots and what they're called all right so you have all these plotting functions made primarily for stand objects that are going to give you a lot of insight and are pretty easy to code up are tidyverse friendly if you know what that means so it's going to help with diagnostic processes not bad so that's why I'm interested in learning stand too. There's just like a nice set of ways that I can do visual investigations. Along with, I'm sure there are computational reasons that I have yet to understand as I move forward, I'm sure I'll become more familiar with. But let's not get lost by not learning along the way. That's my motto here. Okay. So we'll move into chapter five. Chapter five is going to go over some examples of data analysis prep. So we're gonna be looking at just some standard use statistics, it looks like. And we're gonna be calculating them using Bayesian inference.
So here it's just describing what some of the, the value would be for having a Pearson correlation coefficient that not only represented the association between two variables, but gave us a spread of possible values for the association between the two variables. And it also just wants to give us a sense of the utility for using these sorts of um, models. So there's flexibility involved. All right, so here, just while I'm going to walk my way through, we have two means, both of which are distributed Gaussian. So we have a, main, we have a, a vector means here. That's why it's bolded, I guess. Yeah, so it's bolded here a little bit, showing that there's more than one value in there. Yeah. Uniform, pretty non-informative. And then we have this new thing that we haven't seen yet, an inverted square gamma distribution for sigmas, but was mentioned in one of the little side talky things up here. It was in one of the boxes, right? It was spoken about in one of the boxes. And then for our correlation coefficient, a uniform distribution as a prior works nicely because it's range restricted. So we know R is between negative one and one. So all possible values are, are restricted or specified here. So this works. Lastly, X is distributed multivariate Gaussian with these mu's and this variance covariance matrix, which is inverted. So sigma squared. Ah, that's interesting. So another thing they speak about here is using a correlation prior that's more densely populated or more probable around values of zero. So we need sufficient more evidence. We would require sufficient or useful I don't know what, to, what is the word I'm trying to say strong strong evidence in order to demonstrate to not be impacted by a prior where um, we have some belief that it's closer to zero right so that would be almost like hypothesis testing right where we specify priors where we think uh, the association or frequentist hypothesis testing where we don't think there's a relationship so it's we have some underlying belief that the association between these two variables is low, if not nothing, and you know, we want the evidence to, we would update our beliefs in the light of evidence, where if we showed some correlation that was high, you know, I mean, where would it lie now? And here is the text file. So I'm gonna pull up these then. Oh, look, 
looks like. There's some stand code here too. Cool. Just pulled it up while I got it. Correlation one Jags are oh correlation one Jags are and then we need correlation tax. We have our model once again so this is data priors and now we're being introduced to some reparameterization reparameterization so this is where we're going to take values that we estimated here and we're going to use that information to create new variables or variables that are more representative of the information that we're actually interested in. In this case, we are going to take the information like we've done before. We've done this before. We do this with Sigma and, and Lambda, but now we're just generating or parameterizing Sigma. And then we're just going to fill our matrix matrix here so we're gonna take all the values for the matrix and then we just invert the matrix the two data sets see what the text has to say Fabricated data comparing response times in semantic verification task is a whale, a fish, with IQ measures. So we're looking at IQ and whale verification. So they just said uh, these are verification scores, I would guess. These are IQ scores. Cool. We have two data sets, it looks like. This is our first source. Number of units being measured and 11 folks. We're just in these variables. We initialize. R, mu, and lambda, because these are the things that we did not observe. Boop. And then we say, we're interested in sigma. So this is interesting. We specify, so something that too, that needs to be um, just clear. We specify or initialize lambda because that's what we estimate, but we're interested in sigma. So I don't want to see output for lambda. I want to see output for sigma. And sigma is going to be given to me by the parameterization. And here's the jag. Oh. Let's not forget we 
set a working directory because we are in a new folder, data analysis. We're not in Gaussian anymore. Now I can look at R. go the distribution of the two parameters intelligence on the y-axis and accuracy response times response times response times in a semantic verification task how quickly do you answer so we're trying to understand how if how quickly someone answers a question is associated with the, their general intelligence with the idea being that you know someone is able to answer questions or process information more quickly because they are smarter so, not the best theory but a theory nonetheless So this code doesn't break, all work, pictures, we're going to source it. Also the reason why I, I click source here is so that all I have to do is go and it's going to run the code and it's going to give me an update. Something I'm also interested in here, I want the output. So I can do things like this and then, oh. I can spell things wrong too. <laughs> and get the output. Negative correlation on average. Always negative though. This fast on average, this intelligence on average people get faster people as pe people who are less intelligent or slower people who are less intelligent or faster to answer questions but this has nothing to do with how accurate they are oh, it doesn't say that there's also substantially more variability around intelligence and there you go not likely that there is not a correlation there seems to be some evidence for a correlation between the two. Nice. We just did a correlation. Bayesian style. That's pretty cool. Here's this plot. Here's our version. I guess we could make the axes a little prettier. RTIQ. Nice. Alright, the second data set is just the first one repeated twice.
if it's just the first one repeated twice, what we're going to see is just a stronger or more precise estimate here. So all we have to do is change data set to two. And what we're going to see here is a more precise estimation here, a tighter relationship between the two variables. Yep. Boom, boom. There you go, see? We can see that by looking at sigma here and then looking at, oh, well, we can just actually look at our standard deviation here here. Tighter. And larger. So more confidence in there being a negative association now. Because we doubled. We doubled, doubled the data set. More the same. More the same. Oh. My plot here is just wants some room to bleed to breathe. It's like please let me let me breathe. Good. Do you find the priors on mu and mu2 to be reasonable? Let's see. Our priors here are boom and boom. Well, no. I mean, we just showed with the last example that we could we know that the average intelligence score, for example, is 100. So it might just be useful to do something like this. that for a prior not much changed but I feel stronger about my conclusions here again we saw more precise again I mean look at this thing Very precise, skinny. More estimates means stronger or tighter likelihood estimate. Or more influence of the likelihood, right? So we have more data. As for RT, I don't know how these tend to be dis distributed. The current graphical model assumes that the values of the two variables, x, are observed perfectly. Right. When might this be problematic? How could the current approach be extended to be more realistic assumptions? We want to introduce some uncertainty, which we're, uh, see the title there, we're going to talk about this in the next section, it looks like, but it wants to know how can we introduce some uncertainty into our estimates? So it's not the case that 
each observation of someone answering a, a question that they answered it correctly. Some people don't know the thing of a whale. And if they click really quickly, some people don't know a whale is a fish, right? And that's the example it said in the text. And if they clicked really quickly, we'd want to account for them getting it incorrectly and not just count that they were able to do it really quickly. So I want to introduce information about accuracy into this model. How would we do it? account for information about accuracy like that's all I can think of but how do we actually do that here and where in the graphical interface would it be in Sigma or instead of everyone having the same sigma, we would say sigma for each individual, right? So that lets us account for variability in subjects, but not both of the observations. Yeah. Something like that. I would probably go here. Nice. Let's see what it says. It's like that each individual response time is measured very accurately since the physical quantity and good measurement tools exist. Right. Right, so we have pressing a key down to a science. But like before, IQ can be less precise. It's psychological quantity. So we want to account for this uncertainty here and the assessment of the correlation. Observations are now sampled from a Gaussian distribution centered on the unobserved true response time and IQ of that person. So mean centered. So mean centered. These true values are then modeled as X. Previous model. The precision is captured here by lambda to the power of e. Lambda to the power of e. To the power of a constant e. So lambda. So here we have some idea about how precise our measurements are for RT and IQ. And given 
this information about the precision of our measurements for RT, these variables are mean centered, which gets estimated with precision that is specified. And from that information, we can estimate these quantities, which gives us our new estimate of the correlation. So let's open up the data. And yeah, let's open it up. Correlation text two. Correlation Jag two. So first, before we look at anything over there, let's take a look at how we account for uncertainty in our measurements in our model. So here, for each subject in 1 to n, subject for both their measurements is distributed normal multivariate normal a matrix normal I guess it stands for matrix normal or something but we have mu inside and we have our Variance covariance matrix. And then for each measurement occasion, for IQ and response times, the ith individual at one of the measurement occasions is distributed normally IJ subject measurement occasion with lambda error J. So J is saying first column and the second column. The first variable, second variable. For each of the variables, we have some measurement uncertainty. So there are two values here for lambda error. So 
sigma error is something we are specifying beforehand, right? Because it said in the text that sigma was known and shown here, we know what this value is. So we have sigma and now we reparameterize sigma error is to lambda error here. So one over sigma error squared. Initialize what we need. So we need n. We need x. We need lambda error. Starting values r, mu, lambda, and then we're interested in r, mu, and sigma. Here's the model output. And then flat. And then I'm just gonna add give me a print of the samples too. Cool. Introduce measurement error, we get a lower value here. Just have to block, but we'll come back to that. measurement uncertainty here for each of these two. So this is for RT and this is for intelligence. We have less. We assume that the measurement for the intelligence is more variable or more uncertain. So 5.2 does what we were talking about before, where it wants us to look at these. Let's see how they, with the first one. So let's look at this one, because I think this is, looks like we get similar estimates, right? That makes sense, where we're not changing anything about the data we observed. So our estimates of the central tendency or our expectations for the, the average values for RT and intelligence don't change. That much if not at all very little change it looks like just due to random variation in the sampling our r value here oh, oh. this r value is lower this r value is higher let me make sure that this is the right one Yeah, I think it's the right one. Should be good. Anyway. So less variability or more certainty in our estimate here. change should be so once again R didn't really change either 
But what should have changed with sigma? Upon visual inspection, right? The estimate here, spread is less. More spread. So we've introduced uncertainty into our estimates. However, this is this allows us to feel or be more confident about our measurement or our correlation, right? Because we know that we're accounting for more information now, that being information about the reliability of our measurement tool. In this case, large or larger measurement uncertainty in sigma in for intelligence. Generate results for the second data set, which changes that, like compare these results. So now we're just gonna really don't need the data. I don't need the model right now. I need this. So now we're just going to really introduce sigma error. Sigma error to 10. Big error. Look at that. So now we're really unsure about the intelligence is highly variable and this has made it so that the correlation that we observed could could be zero we're just not sure <laughs> these are standard errors by the way so the crosses indicate the measurement uncertainty for RT and then the measurement uncertainty for intelligence and these larger bars obviously are the uncertainty that we have in each of our measurements for intelligence across the sample and this wrecked havoc on our estimates. A lot more variability. Like a lot. No. 0.4. But now our, our credible interval here extends beyond zero. So now we have evidence that zero it's possible that zero is a there's no association between the two here. This also impacted our parameter estimates where even the uncertainty, increase in uncertainty for intelligence even made us question our, our measurement of RT, which is interesting. But lower, or is it lower from you now? Yeah, lower measurements of intelligence extremely lower correlation rate. We were at a 0.7 before, now all this uncertainty is we're at 0.4. Yeah. It's 
of this odd sloping off sort of effect. The graphical model in figure 5.3 assumes uncertainty for each variable is known. How could this assumption be relaxed to the case where uncertainty is unknown? Well, instead of having this be dark, we make it so that we also estimate this value. And we say it's distributed. By something. What have we distributed lambda as in the past? We have it. We haven't yet. So we could we could say lambda is distributed somehow. And that would give us a range of possible values of uncertainty. Right? I'm interested to see the solution for that one. It would be straightforward to extend the graphical model making sigma e variable into parameters with prior distributions allowing them to be inferred from the data. Right. Whether the current data would be informative enough about uncertainty of measurement to allow helpful inference is less clear. So statistically speaking, it's just like what I was saying before, where yeah, we just make it so that we slap a distribution on this, a prior, we set some priors, we estimate a posterior distribution, and then there we go. But we need to think about how informative our data would actually be in quantifying some sort of level of uncertainty surrounding the estimates. That's interesting. Yeah. So continuing, it might be that different sorts of data, like repeated measures of the same people's IQ, are needed for this model to be effective. But we had some information surrounding the variability of the estimates. So we have 11 subjects here or something. If we had repeated measures for each of the subjects, then we could quantify some level of uncertainty about our level, our measurement of IQ, and thus be able to more properly or more adequately gain insight on the precision of the measurement of intelligence from the data there. Last question. The graphical model in figure 5.3 assumes that uncertainty for each variable is the same for all observations. Uh-oh, you know what that means? How could this assumption be relaxed to the case where, for example, extreme IQs are less accurately measured than IQs in the middle of the standard deviation? You could... You could specify Instead of specifying a value for uncertainty sigma, you could specify a range of values, a distribution of values, right? So I could estimate a like, uniform distribution or something where what did it say? I mean, uniform is probably not a good, but we could slap some distribution on sigma. And then randomly samples that. 
or just bound it somehow. So the basic statistical idea would be to model sigma with like its own distribution of values. So we could imagine sigma e here sub i two. So for intelligence for J, I would be a given measurement for this. So each person would have different uncertainty associated with their IQ score. So this would express the relationship between where people lie on the IQ scale and how precisely their IQ can be measured. Whatever relationship is chosen is, is itself a statistical model formalizing assumptions about this relationship. So, and so we can have some parameter and give it prior values and infer it from the data. So sort of like the above example with repeated measures for intelligence, each individual could have a level of uncertainty surrounding their estimate of intelligence. And that can be incorporated into the model. We can set some sort of parameters for our confidence about, or we can set some priors about our confidence of values of uncertainty for various levels of intelligence. So we're less certain in higher values and more certain in values closer to, as it says here, closer to the average, what we'd expect. So around 100, right? and the cap coefficient. So inner rater reliability, great. We're gonna go over that next time. So covering today, we finished up the repeated measures example for IQ, and then we moved into starting to look at some examples of data analysis problems that we were could potentially approach um, and doing so in a using Bayesian inference and then having expressed that graphically here we went about how we could then given that we're using this approach how we could move to more to relax some of the assumptions that we make here identify first identifying some of the assumptions then relaxing those assumptions so that we could introduce things like uncertainty in our measurements, which is a real world thing that could happen, I mean, what, something we'd like to do, and then see how that impacts our estimates of the statistic of interest, in this case, correlation. So the next time we're going to move to just using another statistic, and we're going to see how we can parameterize that. This looks like fun. Wow, yeah. We have a lot of variables that are just being drawn from this. We have this data source here. So that should be cool. We went through some of the code here. And we're just about where I'd like to be for the day. I got my great work up in the corner. If you're if you were curious about what the, the timer was or timer is, is I try to work for a, about an hour and you know if I'm an, an hour and a half in. I use that as an indicator to, you know, I definitely should stop soon because I, I could stay here and play around with this stuff all day, but we're all busy folk. So I just want to get a sufficient amount of practice in each day. And that's it. And no more, no less, right? <laughs> Don't want to be too tired. I have other things that I need to dedicate intellectual energy towards, so thought energy. 
But thank you for sticking around and watching today. I hope you liked the music. Um, let me know if I could keep using music in the future. I'm just realizing that the music might have actually stopped at one point too. But we'll figure it out tomorrow. And I'm going to keep playing around with some of the features in the stream. So this is also a learning sort of exercise for just how to do OBS stuff. If you have any comments or you want me to touch on something more deeply um, or explore an idea, let me know. I'm going to keep working my way through this Bayesian Cognitive Modeling book until I run out of chapters. And if I don't do so by the end of the month, then great. But if I do, you know, I'm going to be looking for different sorts of projects to be working on, something maybe like data simulation. I've been interested in that with some of my colleagues at school. All right, so I'm signing off today then. Thanks, guys, for sticking around. This is great practice, and I appreciate the accountability help.